dense crowd. It's great to see, um, see so many familiar faces. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone to speaker night here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site. This is our opportunity to consider some issues that were important not only during TR's time, but also um, impact us today. I'd like to uh, also thank our sponsors for Speaker Night, uh, MNT Bank and the New York State Council on the Arts. Uh, we couldn't do this without them. And um, as I think most of you know, we are recording uh, Speaker Nights this year and they are available on our website, um, thanks to NISCA's funding. This evening, um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Trina Hamilton. She um, is gonna be talking to us about, uh, her topic is Just Green Enough, a new ethic for environmental cleanup and industrial revitalization, which I think was going to have a lot of uh, resonate, resonance right here in Buffalo. Trina Hamilton is an associate professor of geography at the University of Buffalo. She's a human geographer with expertise on corporate and social environmental responsibility, global governance networks, urban sustainability, and ethical markets. Trina was born and raised in Canada, Edmonton, Alberta, and Vancouver. She received her PhD in geography from Clark, Univ Clark University in Worcester, Mass. And she's been a faculty member in the geography department at UB since 2006. Trina is actively involved in UB's Canada-US Trade Center and the Baldy Center for Law and Social Policy. In addition to the work she's going to present this evening on environmental gentrification, she's currently working on a National Science Foundation funded research project on the ethical diamond trade. Overall, she's interested in how government regulations, social and environmental activism, and market mechanisms such as ethical consumerism drive corporate change and sustainable development. Trina's research and commentary has been featured in The Guardian, The Huffington Post, The Washington Post, and other media outlets. And her first book, co-edited with Winifred Curran at DePaul University, and entitled Just Green Enough, Urban Development and Environmental Gentrification, will be out at the end of 2017, so keep an eye out for that. And please help me welcome Dr. Trina Hamilton. Thanks, Lenora, for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, so as Lenora mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about um, this idea of creating just green enough spaces. Um, so I wanted to start, we're going to have some audience participation um, tonight, since we've got a, a close crowd here. Um, so I want to start with getting you to think about um, what images or activities come to mind when you hear the term green city. What does a green city look like? So if you imagine that in your head, what do you imagine if you hear green city? Trees and plants. Trees and plants, oh yeah, actual green, green things. Alternative energy. Alternative energy, that's a big one. And park systems. Park systems, right? But yeah. I saw in the Times this weekend, uh, there's rooftop vegetable gardening in Brooklyn, the big rooftop gardening. Roof gardening, so yeah, and I will be talking about Brooklyn, so we'll get to some of that. So this is probably the type of thing that you imagine when you imagine a green city. These come from, some of them are in the top left there, my hometown in Vancouver. Um, we've also got images on the bottom there of the High Line in New York City, which some of you may have seen or even visited. Um, and the other two are imaginings of what green cities could look like in the top in New Jersey and the bottom um, in Victoria, BC. Um, anybody imagine anything like this when I say green city? Probably not. This is probably not the first thing that comes to mind. You know, piles of um, uh, scrap metal, and you've got um, you know, kind of crumbling bulkheads along this industrial riverway. A very kind of hidden um, actual boat club there on the bottom right, alongside a manufacturing operation. Um, but these are the images um, of green that I want to talk about tonight. Um, the unexpectedly green neighborhood in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, it's appropriately named, um, that is both cleaning up their toxic legacies but also focused on retaining industrial jobs um, and uh, you know, the industrial character of the neighborhood so that those who suffered through the toxic years, and this is much better than what it's been in the past, I'll show you some historic photos, um, can remain in place and enjoy the cleaned up neighborhood. 
So the Just Green Enough strategy, this is what we've termed it, but this came from our research on the ground and from what people in the neighborhood were telling us they're working towards. Um, it's about making room for continued industrial use and blue collar work um, and not automatically or exclusively leading to the parks, cafes, and a river walk model of the green city that most people think of, and that's what first comes to mind. Um, so indeed, a 2007 New York Times article um, that talked about doing a, um, a boat tour along this creek which runs along the northern border of the neighborhood, it quoted a participant who said, it's extremely interesting to see it on a water level. It looks ugly with all the scrap metal around, but think what it could be with parks, cafes, and a river walk. So that's where we came up with this idea of contrasting that vision um, with this idea of just green enough. So the vision of transforming industrial spaces into spaces for recreation and consumption is rampant nowadays, and it's not unknown to us in Buffalo as well. Um, as cities and regions are declared post-industrial, and um, you have self-described landscape urbanists who are eager to transform them into promenades and playgrounds. So a recent article on urban oases such as the New York City High Line um, argued that monuments to ways of life and work that we no longer require are being converted one by one into promenades and playgrounds, changing what we think cities are for and how they ought to be used. The landscape urbanist sees the decline of the industrial city as prompting a variety of opportunities for naturalism. In cities dominated by service economies, landscape urbanism can clean up the industrial economy by reintegrating it with the natural world. In so doing, it creates an entirely new urban experience. So in this case of the High Line, it makes it possible to saunter in the air among apartments and offices at a much slower pace than at street level. Yet the article goes on to question the potential of these parks and green beltways to drive gentrification and displacement, asking, whom are these new parks for? The High Line is perhaps now the greatest outdoor corporate event space in New York City. The new public parks give form to cities misshapen by abandoned industry, but threaten to bring into being a novel form of inequality in cities already rife with it. They exude the priorities of a new gilded age even as they cover up the eyesores of an old one. And it's not just that these green spaces attract wealth and drive out existing residents, but they represent the city as a space devoid of industry and industrial jobs. And that's what we're trying to challenge with this example. So this is just a map of the study area to kind of situate you. You can see the southern end of Manhattan, and we're just across um, the East River there in Brooklyn at the northern end. So our interviews um, that we've been doing over the past decade now, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but with long-term residents, gentrifiers, business owners, environmental organizations, and local politicians, as well as our observations at community meetings, have reveal, revealed rather a remarkably cohesive community vision for Greenpoint, and specifically um, the shores of Newtown Creek, which is the industrial waterway on the north there. Um, a vision of being just green enough to achieve cleanup and both community and ecological health, but also maintaining working class residents and industrial land uses. So a bit of background about the neighborhood and the ongoing environmental cleanup. I first became aware of this case, and Lenora had asked me earlier, you know, how did I get interested in this topic? Well, I just happened to be reading the newspaper, and I read about then Attorney General Andrew Cuomo's um, launching of a lawsuit against ExxonMobil over an underground oil plume in the neighborhood. Hello? Okay, um, and at the time, the, you know, the description was that this landmark legal action would force the cleanup of a 17 million gallon oil spill under Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and to restore Newtown Creek, the contaminated waterway that separates Queens and, um, and Brooklyn. So the announcement marked the beginning of a new era of state intervention surrounding this toxic legacy, which had been around um, for decades. Um, while long-term residents had been you know, agitating for cleanup since at least the 1970s, national media attention and the state stepped up enforcement occurred only as Greenpoint and surrounding neighborhoods began um, to experience rapid gentrification. So in the words of one longtime resident, um, quoted at the time, I've lived in Greenpoint with Exxon's oil since the early 1970s. Some you know, people we talked to described like a black mayonnaise and ooze coming up in their gardens as they would plant them. Um, and this is the first time that someone's actually going to clean up Newtown Creek for the community. 
So according to the press release, at least 8 million gallons remained in 2007. And you can see here there's various um, attempts to map out, which is really difficult to actually map the boundaries of the oil plume. Um, but they were also revealing that there were toxic vapors coming up into people's homes and businesses. So at the time, Cuomo declared that the worst environmental, one of the worst environmental disasters in the nation. It's larger than the Exxon Valdez spill um, on the shores of Alaska, which most of us have heard about, um, but slower in the cleanup. So as someone who studies um, activist campaigns against companies and attempts to get them to address social and environmental issues, um, I was struck by the fact that this was the largest oil spill I'd never heard about. Um, it hadn't been the subject of a large international campaign, and I was also struck at the time by the fact that this was occurring in the neighborhood just north of Williamsburg, which by now has become kind of, you know, uh, equated with rapid gentrification. So that's when I contacted my colleague, who's the Brooklyn expert and gentrification expert, um, and we decided to ask this question of why was the state finally intervening after decades of inter inaction, rather? Why now? So what we were expecting was that this would be a classic case of what we call environmental gentrification, and I'll get to the definition in a second. But what we found was surprising and led us to um, try to understand a more nuanced vision for the spaces um, and sustainable development goals that were being constructed in Greenpoint, um, and one that had a remarkable consensus amongst business owners, outside environmental groups, long-term residents. So this was kind of a unique um, case that we felt we came across. So first though, what is environmental gentrification? So most people have heard the term gentrification. Um, it tends to um, cause a lot of buzz in, uh, in the news media. Um, and in order to appreciate the lessons from Green Point, it's important to understand exactly what we mean by environmental gentrification. So the idea of gentrification in general is that it displaces existing populations. And usually it's measured by you know, changes in the racial makeup, the income makeup, the educational makeup of a neighborhood um, when redevelopment occurs. So for environmental gentrification, it's specifically about greening processes that then lead to that sort of displacement. And it's not just about driving up rents and, um, and property taxes and that sort of thing, but it's also about remaking um, communities in a way that long-term residents feel they no longer belong that those spaces are created for them. Um, so it's more than just the dollars um, at play here. So this quote from Kenneth Gould and Tammy Lewis frames the problem as, simply put, the main point is that urban greening creates environmental inequality unless equity-oriented public policies intervene, and this increased inequality is incompatible with sustainable development. So the, you know, the challenge here is that we need to actively intervene to make sure that greening processes don't lead to this gentrification. So the problem of environmental gentrification has begun to gain real traction um, within planning and policy circles and has even been picked up um, by the popular press. So one of the architects of the High Line in Manhattan, which is often you know, kind of presented as the success story of transforming you know, industrial spaces into these new recreation opportunities and oases, um, one of the original planners now has regrets. So he was recently quoted in an article um, on the City Lab website by Laura Bliss explaining that when he first conceived of the project in the wake of 9-11, he thought maybe it would attract 300,000 visitors a year, and it would, you know, his only thought was that this would add a little extra breathing room um, to the neighborhood. Anyone want to guess how many visitors a year it gets now? It's more than 300,000, I'll tell you that, but give me a guess. It's actually eight to nine million. It's now one of the top, oh, I finally got the gas. It's waiting for it. <laughs> um, it's now one of the most visited tourist attractions in Manhattan. And the problem is it is mainly tourists. This High Line is bookended by public housing projects, but it's not generally those in the public housing projects who are using it. And so this planner goes on to explain in the article that um, he wished he'd asked, what can we do for you? of the neighborhood, rather than just thinking about aesthetics. Um, and when they actually finally did convene the neighborhood, you know, he says, we realized they needed jobs, they needed affordable cost of living. That were, those were the neighborhood priorities. 
So what makes our case a little bit different, though, is that it's not about creating a park and then protecting the neighborhood from real estate spikes and tourist influx, um, but rather about challenging the increasingly common view that industry is out of place in our cities today. So at the same time, however, the activists in Greenpoint, they want cleanup. Their vision is of ecological restoration and increased vigilance over both industrial and municipal polluters, because there is also raw sewage going into this creek during storms as well. So back to Greenpoint. Greenpoint is defined by its industrial history. I told you I'd have the historical photos. So this is what it used to look like, um, which is why people think it's so much better today. So bordered by Newtown Creek uh, to the north and the east and the East River to the west, this was easily accessible um, from Manhattan by boat. And so by the late 1840s, it had become a center for shipbuilding. And by 1921, according to the Merchants Association of New York, um, some of the activities that went on here were sugar refineries, fiber mills, copper melting works, chemical plants, lumber, coal, and brickyards, steel fabricators, airplane manufacturers, foundries, um, paint and varnish manufacturers, and many others. And you can imagine that at the time there were not a lot of regulations about what they were sending on into the creek or underground. Um, but of the resident population that worked these jobs, um, the Merchants Association explained practically the entire population of these sections may be described as the working class, but they are not the poor and the indigent, but for the most part, thrifty laboring people. They live in clean, light, two and three story brick or wooden houses and are not crowded together in dark, unhealthy tenements. So at the time, 70% were reported to be foreign born, um, with the Irish predominating. While the Irish were the largest group in the 1920s, after World War II, Greenpoint has become a Polish enclave. Um, an additional wave of immigrants um, arrived in the 1980s, fleeing martial law, and you now do have a significant Hispanic population as well. But it's this notion of a kind of uniquely viable and maybe enviable working class space um, that I want to return to in our discussion of what just green enough means. We understand decent working class jobs as an endangered species, maybe nationally, but also in a place like New York City, um, and especially in visions for green cities. And this is what we want to inject back into the planning process. So despite the rosy picture of working class life in the quote above, it's clear from these pictures that um, there was also a toxic stew um, in New York, in Newtown Creek rather. So in 1881, the New York Times described it as the worst smelling district in the world. Um, and uh, this was the result not just of fat boiling and oil distilling, um, but also the fact that New York City began dumping raw sewage into the creek. So despite this toxic legacy, however, uh, Greenpoint has been a target for gentrification since the early 1980s when the Greenpoint Historic District was declared. And as I mentioned before, it sits just north of Williamsburg, which was really the hotbed of gentrification and kind of put gentrification on the map in New York City um, and other places. Um, in 2005, there was a rezoning of parts of the neighborhood, and I know this is a little bit complicated, but the main point here is that purple area on the north, that is a still protected industrial district along Newtown Creek. Um, the parts that were rezoned along the East River there on the left, um, this was part of a Bloomberg push to rezone industrial spaces and increase development, especially condominiums, and basically convert industrial land. Um, into a new housing, specifically at the high end. Um, in this final state of the city address, Bloomberg specifically touted the conversion of industrial areas, um, arguing that we've rezoned old industrial areas and brought them back to life. So the reason we argue these are endangered spaces is that over 40% of the city's acreage was rezoned in this way under the Bloomberg administration. Um, and the result is things such as what um, some other researchers have found, basically a condo corridor that has popped up along the East River. Um, and while generally they include some required um, lower income housing, um, mainly these are high-end kind of developments. Um, despite Bloomberg's best efforts to deindustrialize New York City, though, um, gentrification has not meant the complete erasure of the area's industrial legacy or working class populations. 
Um, so as I mentioned, it remains a protected industrial zone along Newtown Creek, and 2010 census data showed that around 10% of the local population is still involved in production, transportation, and material moving operations. Um, there's also a lot of jobs that are held um, along Newtown Creek by residents of other surrounding neighborhoods. So the industrial identity is still, you know, kind of a significant part of this neighborhood. Uh, the Cuomo lawsuit that originally piqued our interest in Greenpoint resulted in a settlement in 2010. So they got, I believe it was around $18 million from Exxon for greening projects in the neighborhood. Um, 2010 was also the year that Newtown Creek was designated a Superfund site. So if you know anything about Superfund sites, this is basically where the Environmental Protection Agency takes over, declares that this has to be cleaned up, but then they go after the original polluters um, to pay for that cleanup. This is a decades-long process, though. So the designation happened in 2010, but it's now just getting rolling in terms of you know, trying to figure out what should be done. Um, but both of these victories are critically important, one, because they represent a change from this history of not much getting done, um, but also they represent this decoupling of cleanup from industrial conversion. So this is still industrial land, industrial operations, and the cleanup's happening, not because new condos are coming in, but even though this is being maintained as an important um, industrial district. Um, so as the timeline here shows, the oil plume dates back to at least 1950, um, when it was revealed by a sewer explosion. Um, the full extent of oil seepage was kind of uncovered again in 1978 by a Coast Guard patrol that saw an oil slick on the water. Um, but the real catalyst for the current cleanup was a 2002 patrol by the Riverkeeper organization. They just happened to turn their boat on the Newtown Creek, according to the people we talked about, and they saw this oil, and that kind of got their interest in, um, in working on this, on this issue. So this led to a series of lawsuits that, as I said, culminated in the Attorney General suit and the Superfund designation. So one of the first lessons that we learned from our interviews is that the recent wave of activism was consciously built on the foundation provided by what one ex-Riverkeeper staffer termed the five angry women and their cohort of long-term activists in the neighborhood. They'd been agitating since at least 1978 when the Coast Guard discovered the oil. Um, and this Riverkeeper staffer explained that this history of environmental activism and um, that these women represent uh, was you know, something that Riverkeeper consciously sought to tap into. So he argues that in old news clippings that he was shown, it was literally just one, two, three, four, five angry women fighting all these things like incinerators, sewage plants, and having to get things done. Um, they weren't necessarily getting national news, but um, Riverkeeper made the effort to look into the neighborhood, see what was being done, instead of just coming in and taking over um, and you know, promoting their vision of what they've shot rather what they thought the, um, the neighborhood should be. He explains, though, that it wasn't a totally smooth ride, and that people were initially suspicious of Riverkeeper and his likes, um, you know, wondering, who are they? They're this outside group, they're lawyers, are they just trying to get a payoff? Um, but these activists have remained central to the fight for cleanup. And they now recognize that part of their job is basically to educate newcomers about what is there and what the community's vision is. So one long-term activist explained to us, um, they're coming, these outsiders, into the neighborhood not knowing a lot of stuff. And while it's being prettied up, many of the same environmental offenders are still here. And unless there's different groups that are able to get across to newcomers, um, they simply don't know. So one of the gentrifiers who you know, moved into the neighborhood, well-educated, she works in public health, told us, I had no idea about Newtown Creek and what had gone on with the oil spill. And it's incredible because of my background in public health, even prior to living here, I hadn't heard about it. But even when she moved, it took months before she even learned what was underneath the ground. So in other words, these outside environmental groups and new residents had to be schooled, so to speak, about the oil spill issue and the community's desire to retain industrial jobs. So the fight to clean up Newtown Creek has created a newly organized constituency, perhaps originally motivated by self-interest, you know, personal health, um, but now they've really come together around an environmental justice vision. Um, what the new activists brought, though, is they brought new skills that the long-term residents recognized kind of catapulted this issue um, onto the national stage and the state stage. 
Um, it was things like you know knowledge about um, legal skills, public policy, media relations. Right? There's a lot of artists who created um, events that then would get media attention. Um, and Riverkeeper and others have consciously tried to transfer those skills. So they're not just coming in and doing everything, but they are you know, working with the community so that they understand what a civil suit is, what the laws are, who do you call when you spot a violation. So together, these two constituencies have created what, these are not my words, this is a long-term activist who calls it now a kick-ass community, that we're winning all these fights. Um, and they actually won an award in 2013 from the Environmental Protection Agency. So they are now organized around a central organization. There's lots of overlapping groups who work on these issues, but they've created the Newtown Creek Alliance, um, which includes these you know, five angry women, uh, some of them on the board of directors. It also includes some of the industrial actors along the creek who are willing to work on cleanup. It includes riverkeeper lawyers, as well as some of these newcomers to the neighborhood. So the concern, there is some concern about um, turnover of staff at the Alliance, but I think you know, what is really important is that this board of directors is so diverse and includes this connection to these long-term activists. So the self-described vision of the Newtown Creek Alliance is to restore community health, water quality, habitat, access, and a vibrant commerce along Newtown Creek. So it encompasses the environmental and the economic. So it's important to note that, that there is nuance to their advocacy for industrial retention. They're not willing to accept just anything. So a lot of these activists had actually supported the rezoning along the East River in 2005 because there were power plants and other really noxious uses that were being proposed there and they didn't see you know, it being um, something that they were willing to have in their neighborhood. The problem was, though, that they've seen the rise in rents, the rise in property values, the condos going up, um, and the lack of community benefit. So a lot of the parks that were promised to them during that rezoning have not happened yet. Um, so this has kind of informed their current advocacy work um, and the types of greening they're advocating for now. Um, so over the years, greening in Greenpoint has taken many forms, uh, from the recent Superfund declaration um, to advocacy against incinerators and power plants, um, and even you know, slightly more superficial interventions such as um, a local nature trail. While the vision for cleanup is still being actively negotiated through community planning meetings, activist organizations, and the like, um, I want to discuss just a few examples of types of greening projects that fit this just green enough ideal. Um, so the first is what someone labeled uh, the ironic nature walk, because it doesn't look very nature -y, right? This doesn't exactly look like what you all um, said you thought a green city is meant to be. Um, but this has become really beloved by long-term residents. And this actually came before the Exxon settlement. This was a concession from the uh, power, or the rather the wastewater treatment plant that is in the neighborhood. Um, and the argument is that residents have wanted access to the water, even if it's smelly and polluted. Um, and some, you know, long-term assemblyman in the area talks about the fact that he swam in the water as a kid. You know, he probably shouldn't have been doing that, but um, you know, this was something that the residents really wanted. Um, the other thing is that one longtime resident recently said, um, you know, it might look neglected, but this is so much better than what it was in the past. As she said that as a kid, when you went to the water, um, you know, the smell was like a slap in the face that, you know, it was so bad that now at least you can go down there. Um, and the head of the Newtown Creek Alliance now, who's a relatively recent um, incomer into the neighborhood, um, you know, he says they're now seeing mussels and clams and oysters and all sorts of wildlife come back, which I have some more pictures later. Um, so you can get very close to the water here. You can see those steps going down to the creek. Of course, there's all sorts of caution signs. Don't swim, don't eat the fish, watch out for barges. Um, and of course, it's not the ideal nature walk. It doesn't fulfill residents' long-standing demands for more green space, but it has become an important, important rather, meeting space. So the current program director for the Newtown Creek Alliance, who's this younger um, guy who's come into the neighborhood, he talked about the fact when he first got here and walked along the nature walk, um, he saw some of those five angry women, um, you know, who were also there, and they got into conversation. And this is the type of place where you're able to kind of forge those shared visions for what the neighborhood should be. 
Um, so the second example I want to talk about is a visioning process, which was the 2012 Brownfield Opportunity um, Area. And I know we've had some called them BOA uh, processes happening in Buffalo as well. Um, and the point of this BOA process was that they developed um, a vision for the neighborhood um, as a 21st century industrial corridor. So it wasn't removing industry and replacing it with parks. It was integrating ecological functions and green spaces into active industrial areas. Um, so the report that they released describes Newtown Creek as a valuable urban asset because it has working industry, and you need that in a thriving um, urban mega region. So a lot of the products that are produced here are things that are consumed within New York City. Obviously, it doesn't make sense with the high cost of land and labor, um, you know, to have this as an export center. But these are things that are used um, in the city. Um, so it also notes that you know manufacturing jobs, warehousing jobs, these other heavy industry jobs, they pay higher wages and have better benefits than the retail and service sectors, which are the other um, sectors that people could find jobs in. So that's why you know they're these important endangered species. Um, so they, in other words, the shores of Newtown Creek are not sitting idle and toxic, but rather um, there's very little land that actually lies fallow. This is active industry. So it's no wonder then that their future renderings um, for Newtown Creek, they include hard hats, barges, factories, active industry, alongside though restored wetlands and wildlife. Um, so they describe a future, this is obviously still a visioning process, but of an industrial ecosystem where they can make the industry that's there and hopefully bring new industry in that is more, um, that is greener, right? That maybe um, uses waste byproducts from one facility to serve another facility as inputs. Um, and so where they're creating kind of a lively industrial ecosystem. So there's now another BOA visioning process underway, this one led by some industrial advocates, but in both cases their you know, vision is of these twin processes of ecological restoration and industrial revitalization. Um, one example of how the Alliance is actually putting this vision into practice though, that's a kind of visioning document, but this is an actual change that has occurred. This is called the Plank Road site. So it's on the clean side of Newtown Creek. Um, and you can see there the wood is kind of the remnant of a toll bridge that went over the creek at one point in the 1800s. Um, and there's very few places along the creek which stretches about 10 miles where you get this kind of soft edge. So a lot of it is um, you know, kind of bulkheads that were built for industry and barges to come up to. Um, but here you have an important soft edge, which is important for ecological function and you know, attracting wildlife and different flora and fauna. Um, but it's also important because the goal of creating this green space was to serve the broader community, but also to serve the workers who are working adjacent to this. So they got the local um, industry, I think there's a cement plant and others, they helped out with this cleanup, and now you have employees use this on their bricks. So this is a type of green space you know, we don't often think of. We think of going to green spaces in our leisure time. Maybe some of us who are lucky, for instance, to live on university campuses or to work on university campuses, that kind of thing. We can enjoy some green space during the day. But you don't think of factory workers having green space on their, um, you know, right next to their facility and being able then um, to enjoy that during the work day. So that's what makes this you know, kind of unique. So according to the current head of the Alliance, this whole site used to be a total dumping ground. They fixed it up. Um, and you know, although the workers used to stay away, they're now part of the transformation and making use of this as well. So there are, the map there represents plans for expansion. So the orange part is just what they've been able to do to date. Okay, this is where we actually get into some of the, um, the return of nature to Newtown Creek. So the Alliance has been working with LaGuardia Community College and other volunteers to document wildlife on the creek um, to enhance habitat and restore ecological function. So as shown here, there's been somewhat of a return to nature. You might notice the dolphin. That part is not normal, but it was sighted once. Um, <laughs> these other ones that were more normal sites along the creek. 
Um, and in particular, they did recently a ribbed muscle survey. So those muscles are important filter feeders. They act as kind of natural filters for the water. Um, and they were able to find, you can see on this map, um, surprisingly to them, they found those muscles throughout the whole crew. Obviously more uh, prevalent in some places than others. Uh, the point you know, that they mentioned was that this demonstrates the value of designing bulkheads, right? They want industry to be able to operate and use barges and um, have it as a working waterfront, but they also then want to design those bulkheads um, in ways that you know, have spaces for the muscles to attach to, because if it's just a steel bulkhead, there's no space for them to attach. So this type of study you know, informs their future both industrial and um, green development. So these next slides um, are from a recent uh, tour of the neighborhood that we did in the fall where they were opening up some of the green spaces to the public. Uh, and this is a couple of examples of ecological infrastructure being developed. So this is a wildflower garden. Unfortunately, the flowers weren't out at the time. Um, but this was built on top of the Broadway Stages facility. So this is the neighborhood where I'm trying to think of some shows you might know. If you watch Madame Secretary and some other shows, they're filmed here. There's a big Broadway soundstage. Um, and they partnered with the community to develop this green roof on top of one of their facilities. So the idea here is to provide a place for um, pollinators, for birds, um, as well as to filter stormwater. So the reason you get sewage in the creek is because of com what's called CSO, combined sewage overflow. So when there's a big storm, those you know, pipes that carry sewage, raw sewage, they also carry the stormwater and they have to overflow into the creek because it can't all be um, taken in by the wastewater treatment facility. So the idea is if you can capture more of that stormwater on green roofs and through other um, infrastructure, it won't then go into the pipes um, that head out into the creek during storm surges. So other examples are also um, this living dock that they created. Um, so this is just a very small kind of, um, you know, test of these living docks that can be created to provide a place for mussels to attach to for different plants, um, grasses and things to grow, to act as, you know, kind of natural um, restoration of, um, of the environment in the area. So these are just two you know, illustrative examples of um, the Just Green Enough concept. So now I wanna you know, kind of take a step back and think about where did this idea of Just Green Enough come from and how it relates to other discussions that people are having about what should a sustainable city be. And there's two concepts I wanna talk about. The first is the idea of just sustainability. Um, so here the idea is that when we think about green, we tend to focus on the, you know, the actual green part, the ecological functioning, and not enough on the equity part, right? And sustainability is supposed to be about environment, society, and economy, right? It used to be described as this kind of three-legged stool, um, but we often forget the equity and the social piece. Uh, so people have proposed definitions of just sustainability that include um, these different attributes of improving quality of life and well-being, meeting the needs of past, present, or present and future generations rather, um, but also incorporating justice and equity, both in terms of outcomes, right, who benefits, but who's involved in the process. Is the community actually being listened to and active in the process of creating these green plans? Um, and finally, living within ecosystem limits. Um, and the reason that it's plural, just sustainability rather than sustainability, is because there's a recognition that these things have to be tied to the needs of particular communities. So what we've identified in Greenpoint is not necessarily going to be relevant everywhere, and it's not meant to be. It's just one iteration of this idea. The second concept um, that particularly relates to cities is that this is not about you know, a fight between old growth forests and jobs, right? My early introduction to environmentalism was in British Columbia, um, fights about protecting you know, so-called wild natural spaces. In cities though, all of the natural spaces are what we call socio-ecological. They're already you know, kind of um, affected by human action. You could argue that the whole planet is, but um, these are very much remnants of um, human action and the evolution of economies in these places. So if it's not nature versus jobs, it's the idea of understanding you know, beyond nature debates over what is the best green environment. 
Um, so then we get into questions of which social natures do we want? Do we want condos with park spaces beside them? Or do we want manufacturing operations with different kinds of green spaces beside them? Both are you know, about increasing ecological function, but they have different social outcomes necessarily. So the questions are, what do we want to sustain? For whom? Um, and when we design green spaces, who can see themselves there? Who's going to feel comfortable being in those environments? So as I mentioned, our contribution to this debate is this idea of just green enough. Um, our you know, definition of what this means is that as much of the environmental hazard as possible gets cleaned up and removed. That's you know, critical to the community. But you also maintain a working waterfront and industrial uses. So this is a vision, as I mentioned, that has been hammered out in this particular place by those who suffered those toxic years and legacies, um, as well as the gentrification of recent decades. So what makes this case you know, worth celebrating is not that we've uncovered the silver bullet that should be put into place everywhere, but that um, you know, it's inspiring a search for alternatives, um, for different just sustainabilities. So importantly, it's not about as some people have written and you know, challenged us on, it's not about shortchanging people. And so maybe it was unfortunate to choose the terminology just green enough. Um, so some people think this means about you know, just giving them smaller parks instead of bigger parks or just doing shallow greening. Um, that's not what we mean by just green enough, though. It's about aggressive remediation, as you can see in these quotes here from environmental activists and long-term residents, um, but making sure that you retain, as I've mentioned, um, those industrial jobs and spaces as well. So the Riverkeeper, I thought this quote was particularly good, he argued, um, the staffer, that there's a textbook approach to environmentalism that many environmental groups like to apply, but then there's the reality that people need jobs um, and they need to have a place to live. And so they were kind of schooled in this by the five angry women they met on the shores of Newtown Creek. Um, there are some real challenges, though, to implementing this vision. So this is, I think, a you know, kind of optimistic case study um, that has lessons for other places. But there is ongoing gentrification even within that industrial zone. So this is just an example of a hotel that when we first went um, to Greenpoint, there was just a hidden you know, a sign on a door that looked like a regular factory door. And it was basically an illegal residence that was being rented out. Um, it has since evolved on the bottom there. You can see their first, uh, you know, kind of um, hotel um, entrance. And then now it's this much bigger, you know, proudly announcing themselves as this kind of industrial chic hotel on the shores of a Superfund site. But people are paying, believe it or not, 300 to a thousand dollars a night to stay in these um, these fancy four-star um, apartments. The next change that is occurring is just you know, off to the side of this industrial zone along the East River. This is what's now being built. It's called Greenpoint Landing. It's a 20-acre um, mega project that's going to encompass 5,000 apartments um, in the end, um, schools, and some parkland. Um, but this is a much different vision from the Brownfield Opportunity vision of a you know, kind of working waterway. And none of these renderings, they all kind of you know, fade to brown when you see the industrial side. Um, you can kind of see it um, get to, in this one, right? So behind these big towers, you, know, you don't really understand the active industry. So the only industry, if we go back here, that you see is this rusted out boy that's there that's really just an art piece. It's not a reference to the active industry occurring right adjacent, um, but it's meant to suggest that industry is a historical um, past for the city. So there has been in community meetings um, a sense and a desire to fight these towers, but they are likely going through. They did get some stronger concessions, though, on um, lower income housing um, that is being built. But you know, this is definitely a pressure for more gentrification in the area. So finally, I want to end with a few lessons from Greenpoint. Um, the first is that these greening processes and you know, efforts to stop environmental gentrification are ongoing. There's no simple planning solution. You can't just slap up an industrial zone 
um, and argue that that's enough. So as I mentioned, there are these pressures that remain, even in the industrial zone, where things like hotels are allowed to exist alongside manufacturers, and then they end up complaining about the manufacturers and push them up. Um, there's also a need to have both a movement, so a broad-based movement that gets national attention, that gets the Attorney General on side, um, but also a central organization that remains stable. So something that we've um, talked to people about in our recent interviews is a concern that you know, there's a lot of you know, great incomers who are involved in the alliance, um, but they probably are not going to be able to afford to put down roots in the neighborhood. So it's important that you still have those um, long-term residents, but we don't know how long um, they'll be in the community. So it's important to at least have the structure of this Newtown Creek Alliance. So if somebody leaves, and they've now had, I think, three um, directors, incomers who've come and gone, um, that the structure remains, so that there's always a search for somebody new, um, and it's not just a kind of unorganized movement. Um, third, it's important um, that it's not just about setting aside some space for industry, but as I mentioned, rethinking what should the green spaces be for? Who should they be for? Maybe they're for workers and not just for um, leisure in your, on your weekends. Um, also, it's important to think through who pays and who benefits. So they've been successful because they had these millions of dollars from the Exxon settlement, and that's how a lot of these um, greening initiatives and there have been others um, got done, but they've now spent that money. And so the concern that they expressed this fall was we're not having to scramble to figure out where is the money coming from. So it's great to kind of decouple greening from you know, condo development and having developers pay for it, um, but now they have to figure out who's going to fund it. And it's unclear you know, what types of greening initiatives foundations and businesses are going to want to fund. So that's you know, partly what's up in the air now. Um, balancing stakeholder interests and mediating conflict. So I kind of presented a rosy picture of everybody coming together um, around this vision. And it's true, but there are specific fights, for instance, about those bulkheads, right? The industrial advocates want steel bulkheads that are better for businesses and barge traffic. And the environmentalists want things that muscles can cling to, right? So they're fighting over that. They're fighting over um, you know, the details of the Superfund process. It's a highly complicated and technical process. So yes, it's designated to be cleaned up, but exactly how is that going to happen? And what is going to be the final you know, level of, um, of clean that they're able to achieve? So all of these activists have to be continually involved in that process as well. And finally, as I mentioned, we've had some pushback around this idea of just green enough because maybe, unfortunately, due to our choice of words, but that's also what got attention to it, um, is that there's a concern that it can be co-opted. And so that using this term, just green enough, if you don't read our you know, full articles, not everybody wants to read a lengthy academic article where we give all the details. Um, but you know, if you don't read the full story, you might think that we're advocating you know, to shortchange these communities. And that in order to fight gentrification, you just have to make places less pretty or you know, less clean. And that's not, hopefully you got that that's not what we're advocating. Uh, so just to wrap up, after you know 10 years since our initial field trip to Greenpoint, we're still unwilling to predict the future. We do, however, though, when we go to the neighborhood, we see more than residential towers coming up and scrap barges going along the creek. We now see the oil plume on it. We don't actually see it, but we know that it's there. We see this history of activism in the community. Um, we see you know, the residents battling on, sometimes for concessions, sometimes for bigger visions. Um, and the point is that even when gentrification is underway, it's a process that's continually contested and remade. And it's important to make sure that we inject these equity concerns into that process as it moves forward. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to open it to questions.